morning or afternoon, all you cool cats and kittens. This is the uh, UC University of Cincinnati first year poetry cohort, sans Taylor Bias. Um, and we thought we would give you another reading for Poetry Month. We have a special guest, um, one of our professors and mentors. Um, so we'll go around and introduce ourselves and then we'll get started. Um, I'm Nick Mulbear. Hi, I'm John Drury. Hi, I'm Mary Ann Chan. And I'm Connor Yuck. And I guess I'm going to start with a, a poem. Uh, I was uh, asked to read a poem by someone I love, and I immediately thought of the person whose house I moved into, who's uh, <laughs> Wanda Walters. And it's one of our uh, uh, affinities is poetry, poetry writing. Um, and um, Lawanda uh, has, and I've both been writing for a long time, but she published her first book three years ago, three years, four years ago, 2016. Uh, it's called Light is the Odalisque. And since then, she had a poem accepted in poetry. And she's recently had another one. She has one forthcoming, but her first poem in poetry is called Woodcut. And uh, it was inspired in particular by some illustrations I'm going to share. They're by a, um, an illustrator named Fritz Eichenberg. So I can get this up here. And I scanned them. And they should be coming. There's one. Okay, this is the first one. Fritz Eichenberg um, did woodcut engravings for a lot of books. But in, in this case, it's uh, books by the two of the Bronte sisters. This is from Wuthering Heights. It's Kathy breaking through, or the ghost of Kathy breaking through the window. And the guest is sort of <laughs> astonished that a hand is, a cold hand is holding onto him through this window. Um, so, and the other one also by Eichenberg is this one. This is from Jane Eyre. And it's uh, <laughs> Jane Eyre being sort of awake and frightened in the night by uh, the woman with the candle from the from the attic. Um, so anyway, uh, these are both pretty terrifying pictures, I think, and that's the the effect. Um, so the poem itself. Here's the poetry website and her poem woodcut. Um, she's writing about mainly about Jane Eyre, a little bit about Wuthering Heights because of the illustration. Um, but she's also writing about the life of Charlotte Bronte, who married very late and had a very short, virtually honeymoon length marriage before she died. Um, uh, and for Lawanda, it's in one of her go-to forms. It's a pantoum. And she often does that. The next poem in poetry is called Relief Relief. And the re first relief is based on the relief program of tr free trees that the Cincinnati Park System offers to people. We have three in our front yard right now that are leafing and blooming and so on. Um, uh, but let's see, for this one, yeah, the, the new poem of Relief Relief is a Villanelle, an extended Villanelle, but this is, you'll hear the repetitions. She doesn't adhere strictly to the repetition of lines. She always varies them, but you'll, you'll hear the echoes. John. Yes. We can't, we can't see the- You can't see the poem? The poem on the screen. Uh oh, what do you say? Are you seeing anything? I wonder why it's not coming up. Let me try it again. Uh, were you seeing me or the other illustration? Just a gray page. Okay, let's try this, this again. Is that coming up? Yes. Oh, there we go. I don't know what happened before. Sorry about that. But everything I said applies to it. I'm not, I won't. I'm, I won't repeat it. So anyway, here's here's woodcut by. Lawanda Walters, the, one of the, well, the poet I love, I should say. The trouble with Jane Eyre isn't what I thought when I slammed shut the book on those pictures trying to fly out at me because I misunderstood being too young to read. When you're unable to read a book, you can't understand the illustrations either. Those were my mother's books, a green bound set of that one and the book by her sister, Emily. When you can't understand the artwork, the face at the window is a monster. It is only Kathy, though, in the book by Bronte's sister, calling for her lover, and the awful figure bending 
over Jane's bed with the candle, that monstrous creature. Well, there are flaws in the mind of Jane too, and the awful figure bending over her might be the tormented wife of Rochester. There's a flaw in Jane's mind too, looking down on the young French child born to another tormented mother, whom Rochester says has inherited sin. The young French child likes presents too much, likes to dance and sing, and so what? She is love-starved, the child who has supposedly inherited sin, who will never get the approval of Mr. Rochester. We lose track of the pretty child who likes to sing. Jane goes away for a while to prove her purity. Then, when the other wife dies, Mr. Rochester will approve. Reader, I married him, she says, after she has gone away for a while. He is blind from the fire the crazy wife set. And then, miraculously, her love asks if she is wearing a blue dress. I believe she is pregnant then, carrying a child who will be a good child, miraculously. Charlotte Bronte knew only part of the happy ending. Perhaps he gets better and sees the blue dress. We have to believe things turn out well, while Charlotte herself had nine months of pleasure and died. And so the book, which ends as if resolved, asks us to believe things turn out well. The French girl gone, Rochester and Jane, and the baby in the burned out mansion. Because books then ended resolutely and did not reflect how it is to have a calm life. Rochester and Jane and the baby in the burned out mansion illustrated by the art of the woodcut, which does not suggest such a calm life, but a knife and fire making art out of wood in a mansion that itself has been sculpted by fire and breaking things, which is how we really live. Great. Thanks so much, John. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. And thanks. Okay. To um, I am going to read a poem by Nicole Seeley. I'll share it. Um, I'm doing a presentation on Monday about facts in poetry and how facts can be used as sort of a prompt in, in your writing. And so I wanted to read this poem because I've just been thinking about it a lot. And so this is called the first person who will live to be 150 years old has already been born. Okay. Scientists say the average human life gets three months longer every year. By this math, death will be optional like a tie or dessert or suffering. My mother asks whether I'd want to live forever. I'd get bored, I tell her, but she says, there's so much to do, meaning she believes there's much she hasn't done. 30 years ago, she was the age I am now, but unlike me, too industrious to think about birds disappeared by rain. If only we had more time or enough money to be kept on ice, until such a time science could bring us back. Oh, I think life short-lived. I'm too young to convince her otherwise. The one and only occasion I was in the same room as the Mona Lisa, it was encased in glass behind what I imagine were velvet ropes. There's far less between ourselves and oblivion, skin that often defeats its very purpose. Or maybe its purpose isn't protection at all, but rather to provide a place similar to a doctor's waiting room in which to sit until our names are called, hold your questions until the end. Mother, measure my wide open arms. We still have this much time to kill. Wow, nice. Um, so for my poem this week, uh, it is spring in Cincinnati, um, and uh, but I keep getting messages and photos from my family up in Michigan about the snow. Um, and also I know Taylor, uh, who we miss right now, is in Chicago and uh, I heard there was snow up there as well. Um, so I'm reading uh, Larry Levis's uh, Gossip in the Village. Um, and I will go ahead and share this. Um, and I first had this poem, heard this poem read aloud um, by Bill Olson um, in my MFA, and um, it was just 
I don't know. Uh, this is one of the poems that I have tacked up somewhere in my apartment, um, which I think I did as well uh, for a previous poem we read in this series. But um, this is called uh, Gossip in the Village. So, I told no one, but the snows came anyway. They weren't even serious about it at first. Then they seemed to say, if nothing happened, snow could say that, and almost perfectly. The village slept in the gunmetal of its evening, and there, through a thin dress once, I touched a body so alive and eager I thought it must be someone else's soul. And though I was mistaken, and though we parted, and the roads kept thawing between snows in the first spring sun, and it was all, like spring, irrevocable, irony has made me thinner. Some day, weeks from now, I will wake alone. My fate, I will think, will be to have no fate. I will feel suddenly hungry. The morning will be bright and wrong. Yeah. Um, so for my poem to wrap it up, I'm going to read a poem um, called The Last Judgment by Aaron Adair Hodges. And it's in this book, which has the best title ever, Let's All Die Happy. Um, it won the 2016 Agnes Lynch Storette Poetry Prize. Let's see. Okay. The Last Judgment by Aaron Adair Hodges. I come to you in all seriousness, reverent as a turtleneck. I am graceless but I am not depraved. I went to synagogues for a year because I had lost God and was trying to find him, following clues with my oversized magnifying glass held up to my giant eye, lashes collapsing like jaws, grilling congregants under the naked light bulbs of my longing. I kept just missing him. He went that away. Maybe I wanted to be Jewish, to be done with Jesus, but not yet break up with God. As if moving into the guest room, but leaving my clothes in the other closet, that version of myself. The ghost, of the house I live in, old me phantoms surround, fuck around with the furniture, make all the mirrors tell the truth. One night, I have a dream my husband leaves. And the nightmare part is that I'm relieved. And so I finally see who I am. It's not that I got used to loneliness, only that it was too late to learn anything else. The first time a man touched me, it was to lower me into the out. New fish, the sin picked clean. I was saved as if I could be spent, saved, I saved myself for God, or if not God, then a man God sent, posing us toward each other in a desert diorama, his holy homework. But the first two boys I loved are dead. So at night, I give myself to them, unzip the hollows, usher them into the pitch. The books inside me are, I birth the boys as my son whom I love and yearn to forgive. All right, well, that's your week three poetry reading for uh, Poetry Month. We'll have one left at least, probably more. <laughs> See ya. Bye. All right.